No, you're you're right there. There's Betty Sue over in the corner, ladies and gentlemen. See her over there. She does not want to be there, so I'm going to push her out of the way. No more Betty Sue, ladies. Well, no more Betty Sue in your picture. Betty Sue is here. It is a wonderful, wonderful thing. She is working upstairs in what we call the up up, and we've got a one of those portable air conditioners in there. That's good. We've got a portable air conditioner in in um, the bedroom. That's good. The cats, they wander around. Anyone out there? Anyone out there? Watch? Oh, seven people are watching. Hi, seven people. I've basically forgotten how to do these. So I'm just going to plunge right in, ladies and gentlemen. I'm going to plunge right in. Terry Hudson says, hi, Charlie. Where are you, Terry Hudson? You're in Springfield, Massachusetts, I believe. You're in Springfield, Massachusetts, about to make your way up to Bellows Falls, Vermont, as far as I, as far as I recollect. Well, welcome to the East. Welcome to the East. I'm sorry the weather is so humid and unpleasant, but so it goes. Hi, everybody. Anyway, it is time for Benchley Night. And as I say, it's been a long time since I've done a Benchley Night, and I basically don't remember how to do them. And uh, hopefully I'll remember, and hopefully during the month of August at least, we'll have them every week. Then in September, I go away again, but then I'm back, and we'll keep on going. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much for supporting the Liberal Snowplowing Do-Gooder Fund. It means a lot, especially since the beneficiary tonight is Bellows Falls' own Rockingham Entertainment Development, a.k.a. my personal slush fund. Not true. Not true. All funds go to helping the Bellows Falls Opera House. And it is a, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to be doing, ladies and gentlemen. And we have a few people to thank. We have a few people to thank. Let us start with our wonderful neighbor down the road, down the road in Saxons River, Vermont. She briefly stuck her head in the door this afternoon to drop off a check. Our good friend, Ms. Martha Rowley. Well, down there in Springfield, Massachusetts, sometimes out there in uh, St. Louis, Missouri, sometimes anywhere at all, you never know, ladies and gentlemen. You never know where she is, the peripatetic Ms. Terry Hudson. <coughs> out there in Cincinnati, Ohio. Out there, out there keeping an eye on Mitch McConnell. Keeping an eye on J.T. Vance running for Senate. Good God. Mr. J. T. Mayor. <coughs> My artist friend, the incomparable, the stalwart, Ms. Catherine Fisher. <coughs> a new friend, ladies and gentlemen, new friend. He's a rail fan. He's an idealist. He now lives in northern Vermont. Mr. Jim Frisk. <coughs> Out there in Omaha, Nebraska, another fine human being. It's, it is very funny to me, ladies and gentlemen. Most fine human beings I know turn out to be rail fans. You wouldn't know that initially, but they all tend to love rail travel. Mr. Jim Frisk, Mr. J.T. Mayer, Ms. Terry Hudson, Ms. Martha Rowley. I don't know if Catherine Fisher's taken many trains yet, but add to that our good friend out in Omaha, Nebraska, Mr. John Wilhelm. <coughs> and then today, ladies and gentlemen, Ms. Betty Sue and I had breakfast, had breakfast with this individual, with this individual and his excellent wife, Elise, and their little dog, Ginger. And Betty Sue said to me afterwards, she said, my, that cousin of yours, he is very, very, very tall. He is a very tall cousin indeed, ladies and gentlemen. He joined us for breakfast today at Cafe Loco at Harlow Farm. Mr. Nat Hunter and his excellent wife, Elise. <coughs> now they, they showed up, ladies and gentlemen, with their own unidentified unglit mechanics. Except theirs was identified. It said like moo cow on it. So they had a moo cow. Mine, you never know if it's a sheep or a pig or a cow or a a grotesque uh, quadruped, 
or um, also little little um, baby chicks. I don't I don't think it's a baby chick. Anyway, ladies and gentlemen, I have blathered long enough. I have killed six minutes blathering. So let us be done with that. Let us move on to a bit of classic humor from the great Robert Benchley. And as I was saying to my tall cousin today, I love doing these. I so appreciate your being here to watch because I get to channel my father who loved Robert Benchley and James Thurber. And it brings me great delight to read these to you. Thank you so much for being a part of this. Bringing Back the Morris Dance by Robert Benchley. I don't know why I never thought to speak of it before, but we do not do nearly enough Morris dancing in this country. These fine early summer days or early winter days or whenever you are reading this, it seems a shame to be devoting ourselves to golf and to tennis and to drinking when we might be out of doors prancing around a pole and falling down. <laughs> and falling down every few feet. In merry england -y, they used to have quite a good time doing this, and there is no reason why we shouldn't today, except that good poles are sometimes hard to get. Poles with rye bands on them are practically unknown. The thing to do is get a pole and put the rye bands on yourself, and then you are sure that they are fresh. Of course, it is not necessary. It is not necessary to have a pole for your Morris dance, but it is better because then you have something to lean against when you get tired. I am tired before I start. <laughs> Just thinking about it. The chief thing for Morris dancing is a smock and lots of rye bands. I am sorry to. I am sorry to keep, I'm sorry to keep harping on this rye band business, but you are just nobody in Morris dancing circles unless you have a lot of rye bands hanging off of you. These serve to float in the wind and to trip you up. I'm going right ahead in this thesis on the assumption that rye bands are the same as our ribbons, although I have not looked it up. If there is something else entirely different, then I am getting myself into a terrible mix-up. I might better stop right here. Bells are also worn strapped to the dancers' legs to give warning to, other, to the other dancers and to show where each individual is at any given time. These dances used to run on way into the night sometimes, and without the bells, there would be nasty collisions and perhaps serious injury. It is essential that the bells be strapped tightly to the legs. Otherwise, the dancer will have to keep stooping and, <laughs> and hitching them up every few minutes, thereby spoiling the symmetry of the dance figure. If the bells are loose and there's no way of tightening them, the next best thing is to have a very small child run alongside the dancer and hold them up. It would have to be a very, very small child, though so small as to be almost repulsive. I had always thought, when I thought of it at all, that the name Morris Dance came from William Morris, who designed those old Morris chairs. By the way, did you ever see a Morris chair that wasn't old? They must have been new. They must have been new sometime when they were bought but by the time anyone ever got to looking at them, the seats were all sunken in and the arms covered with cigarette burns. Perhaps that was the way that William Morris designed them. I frankly don't know. As I look back on them now, it also seems that they were always awfully low, so low as to be almost a part of the floor. It was always very difficult to get up out of one once he got in. And I wouldn't be surprised if a great many people are still sitting in them. Which would account for a great many people that have been missing for a very, for a very long time. Expeditions might be started to go out and get missing people out of Morris chairs. 
or maybe you don't care. Well, anyway, it was not William Morris who worked up the Morris dance because he came a great deal later and was too busy with chairs. I understand that the Moors in Spain did the first Morris dance and called it the Morisco, probably a trade name. Probably a trade name like Nabisco or Delco. It is barely possible that one of the Marx Brothers' ancestors, namely Morris, invented it and began that pleasing trick of nomenclature which has resulted in Groucho, Harpo, Chico, and Zeppo amongst his descendants. At any rate, the dance that the Moors used to do was the Morisco, and Morris was apparently as near as the English could get to the handle. You would think that a great big nation like England could get the little name Morisco correct, but no. We are told that in Merry England, one of the dancers was always decked out as Robin Hood, quote, with a magpie's plume to his cap and a russet beard, which is as lousy spelling as you will see grouped together in any one sentence anywhere. At first, the only music was that of the bells, but that got pretty tiresome after a while and they brought out a flute or a tabor, which probably added nothing. I can offhand think of nothing more dismal. Of course, I hope that you don't think that I am under the impression that the Morris dance was the first outdoor dancing done by people. I am not that much of a ninny. The first records that we have of such things are those of the Egyptians, about 5,000 BC. And what a long time ago that was. Nobody knows what they had to dance about in 5000 BC, but they were hard at it. For we find pictures. For, for we find pictures of. For we find pictures of them dancing on their sarcophagi. That is, they didn't dance. They didn't dance on the sarcophagi, but they drew pictures on their sarcophagi of dancing, which must have been almost as painful. In this dance, eight maidens from the local maidenry danced around and around with no particular idea in mind, finally falling down when they got tired, which was anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. This left them with the rest of the afternoon free, but they probably weren't good for much. Most of, most of all the folk dancing that followed has been based on the same idea. Go round and round and round and round and then stop. In the Chinese dances, they did a great deal of banging as they danced, striking swords on shields and scowling. But there is no record of anyone ever getting hurt. They got awfully tired, though. That seems to be the story of all group dancing through the ages, people getting awfully tired. It is a wonder that no one ever thought of just not dancing at all. Sometimes, of course, the dances did mean something, usually an appeal to the rain god to do something about the crops. The Egyptians had a dance like this, but one, day, one year they did it too well and got nothing but rain. So they had to work in a figure which was an appeal to the sun god to come and drive away the rain god. This resulted in a lot of hard feelings between the sun god and the rain god. And the entire dance had to be discontinued with the result that for about 50 years, no crops came up at all. But we're getting away from our Morris dance, which is perhaps just as well. By the 16th century, you would have thought that people would be working up something new in the line of dancing. But the only difference between the Morris dance and that of the Egyptians was the bells on the legs. The Egyptians also danced sideways a lot, which, 
which made it difficult for them to get anywhere much. The English rustics did know enough to dance at least forward and backwards, but that isn't much of a development in over 6,000 years, don't you think? A lot of people try to read sex meanings into dancing, but that seems to me pretty far-fetched. By the time you've been panting and blowing around in a circle for five or 10 minutes, keeping your mind steadily on maintaining your balance and not tripping, sex is about the last thing that would enter your head. Havelock Ellis even goes so far as to say that all life is essentially a dance, that we live in a rhythm which is nothing but a more cosmic form of dancing. This may be true of some people, but there are others among whom I am proud to count myself, to whom life is a static, to whom life is static, even lethargic, and who are disciples of the Morris who designed the Morris chair, rather than the Morris who designed the dance. Havelock Ellis can dance through life if he wants to, but I think I will sit this one out if you do not mind. All right, ladies and gentlemen. All right, that concludes Benchley Night for tonight. We will see you. Uh, we'll see you on Wednesday if you're into a uh, reasonably fine art talk. I'll be talking at 1:45 p.m. Wednesday about the recent plein air events that I've been at. And otherwise, we'll see you next Sunday, same place, same time, with some other delicious bit of tidbit of American humor. Thanks again. You take good care. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye.